Well, hello. It is Friday afternoon again here in Toronto, Canada. And um, I'm so excited to do these webinars. And I see from the last couple of weeks, we have people from literally all around the world. And it's always such a pleasure to do this because just like you, I learn a lot. And I'm super psyched today because we have Karen Liebrand with us. And she is not only a fantastic writer, also a veterinarian and an author. And I had the pleasure to talk to her briefly today. And um, that's why I like doing this because it's, you will find people who have the horse as number one in mind rather than the mighty dollar. And in the equestrian world, we get very quick, as all of you know, this is why you follow Saddle Fit for Life, see sometimes in this industry uh, a wrong turn of event. And the people who are left behind are the people who started late in this industry, people who love horses. And for me, this is why this is so much fun, sharing what I learned as a rider myself, as a competitor myself. For me, it's a duty to tell what I've been told from my masters to write. So as a master saddler, I went after my certification to the specialists from all over the world. I wanted to know from professors who teaches at different universities, when it comes to saddles, what does and does not work for the horse. Now, that's a uh, a topic in itself, but I don't want to uh, go too long. After that, I also went to the Spanish Riding School and I find it fascinating what they still teach there since 400 years, that the seed is so, is so important. And um, the sentence, what is quoted several times, that the rider got to have a pliable seed only to find out from doctors on my search to, to build an academy what is surrounded with experts from all over the world. I find this um, a medical doctor who says um, there is long-term damage you create to the rider when you ride in the wrong gender appropriate saddle. That doesn't mean every male rider has to ride in Western saddle or every female has, rider has to ride in English. It's just that as a master saddler, I learned from a master saddler, and we as men built saddles for men for four and a half thousand years. And in the last, well, since 1978, that is, wow, 42 years ago, the majority of the riders are women, no matter where I am in the world. So when we see pictures like that, then it's no surprise. Dr. Solange Miguel is now teaching saddle fit for life in Brazil and the academy, uh, sorry, in the university. She is uh, a big spokesperson on thermography. I learned so much how a uh, proper thermographer can really help in so many aspects. And of course, for the horses. Independent from that, I came in my travel around the world to veterinarian who dissect horses and then put on the uh, selected horse here, we see this veterinarian uses a tree to demonstrate that the saddle has to stay behind the shoulder, not to damage the cartilage. And then of course, in South Africa, uh, one of my um, really favorite veterinarians who is also work in the UK, she is a show jumper and she has uh, um, dissected over 200 horses, but she always, has either known this horse or has videos of the horse and knows the saddles and how it's been trained. And she has come up with incredible findings of the bone deformed from a certain way of riding and certain way of, well, equipment fit. And then we know uh, this gentleman, um, uh, Dr. Gerd Heuschmann, who um, was in the German training center in the Olympic training center in Warendorf sold his practice and went back to his first profession, not because he's a horrible veterinarian, 
but because as a veterinarian, I, this is his words, I went to university to become a veterinarian to do no harm to animals. And I'm disgusted to see how many veterinarians just inject or just fixes the legs rather than symptoms. As a rider himself, he says, I'm looking what's on top of the horse. I'm going to go now and teach people there's other ways to ride and make sure we are not hurting the horses. And of course, many clinicians around the world have seen quite a bit of damage caused by horses because they hang in the horse's mouth or they're sitting in the chair seat. Beautiful veterinarian, um, very, as, as a fellow eventer, she's also an event rider, has written uh, um, an equine paper on facial expression of the horse. Um, not too long ago, what coincidental was on my first book was published, because I always say, the horse don't know how to lie. Look at the eyes, the ears, the mouth, and um, very proud to say that this particular book is in several universities. And that's what Saddle Fit for Life is. We wanted to surround ourselves with experts. And this is now online. It's an academy where people can learn. You don't have to be a saddle maker or a, a professional trainer or veterinarian. Anybody who loves a horse and wants to understand and learn from these professionals, like I do, learn every time. And I'm very grateful for Sonia who helps me and put this um, Saddle Fit for Life online to find people um, who we had last um, week a, a wonderful uh, a seminar with our expert in breeding, wonderful videos and books she has written. But today, today is about a person who you probably saw the advertising uh, on our social media. I had the pleasure to talk to uh, Karin and immediately I have a goosebumps when she shared her story, how horrible and hard it was at times when even their friends, just like mine, turned away because we, we speak for the horses and we stay our path if we don't speak for the horses. I don't make saddles what are good for horse and riders and veterinarians don't follow like Dr. Heuschmann or Sue Dyson don't follow with the best interest for the horse. What, what chance is there to have? So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Karin Liebrand, who is not only a um, dressage writer, she's also an author and she travels all around the world. Karin, thank you so much for coming today. And it's my pleasure that you are here today. And I'd like to welcome you and I'd like you to take over now and tell our viewers who you are, why you do what you do, and please enrich us with your knowledge. Well, thank you, Jochen. Uh, thank you for your invitation to be uh, as a guest speaker in your webinar. Um, well, like Jochen said, I'm a veterinarian. And when I went to veterinarian school, I really wanted to be there for the horses to take care of them and to improve their health. And I found out very quickly actually that I wanted to be a sports veterinarian but that meant that I was supposed to know how much medication I can actually give a horse um, enough to kill the pain so he could still perform but not too much so it was not detectable in the doping test and then I was like well wait a minute this is not what I want to do because I believed that if you want to do sports on high level you need a very healthy and also happy horse so also a mentally happy horse and that was actually when my eyes started to open that um, it's in sports not always about the best interest uh, for the horse and not about the health of the horse and then I decided to go on a different pathway and this is how I found out why so many horses get lame and how we can prevent it and it's actually a long story I can talk for two weeks about it and I have I guess 15 minutes so uh, let's start. Um, I, uh, I've been drawing a horse for you and I hope it's visible for everybody. And uh, you can see that I'm not a professional artist in drawing horses, but I did my very best. And um, if we look at this horse, this is a correct forward, downward, outward posture. And forward, downward, outward has been um, imputated in very different ways. 
because we see horses like this and horses very low. But this is a good posture because I, I will just talk about the characteristics. So first of all, forward, downward, out is forward with the nose, downward with the neck. And not as we see it many times, um, downward with the neck, but the nose is behind the vertical and going forward in a very high speed because that means that the horse will fall on the forehand. So if you look at this horse, you can see that his neck is making an arch. So his neck is going upwards from the withers and then following a nice arch. The nose is in front of the vertical and the leg is actually following the same angle. The foreleg is restricted by the shoulder blade. So as far as the shoulder blade can go, and of course this is the opposite leg, but we have a sort of straight line. It was supposed to be straight, but like I said, I'm not a professional drawer. <laughs> so um, what happens then if the horse is in a correct forward downward outward posture, the wheels start to lift and also the back starts to lift. In that case, the forelegs can go forward, but and the hind legs need to go forward as well. So this is actually your basic posture, which allows the horse to already shift a little bit of weight on the hind quarters and the withers come up. So this is step one. From here, the horse has not too much weight on the forehand. And from here, the horse can start to develop more by shifting more weight, which has to be taken step by step. So most of the time I see riders and they have a horse in forward, down, out of posture. And one day they decide, now let's collect the horse. But that needs to be taken step by step, baby steps, because it's all about technique. So the horse needs to learn that technique, but the horse also needs to straighten his body. So if we look at this horse, we can see the silhouette of the horse. And then we can see that the back has a sort of S-carve, a horizontal S-carve. But that is not actually what is happening inside the body of the horse. So if we look at the position of the vertebrae, we can see this. So we have a, a horizontal S-carve here in the neck, but here, and this is the place where the vertebrae of the neck uh, go into the vertebrae of the, of the back, the, so the thoracal vertebrae, and here the lumbar vertebrae. From here, it is actually a straight line, which does make sense because if you are sitting on a back that is hollow, because the horse has that S-carve, like it looks as if it has an S-carve, it is unstable. You hardly ever see a bridge, at least not for cars, that is built like this. Most of the time it's built like this or it's built straight. And if it's built like this, they have um, a construction that will stabilize it. But horses don't have that construction, so we want their backs to be straight. So let's see what happens if we are asking the horse to go into a low, deep and round posture. And of course, it's better if the horse is um, at the vertical. It's better than behind the vertical. But still, if you do a forward, down, outward posture, it should be in front because even at the vertical will shorten the neck. So if the horse is doing something like this, we can see that this part, the cervicotorical transition, lowers. And that means that the first part of the back becomes hollow and the horse needs to compensate by flexing this part, so the lumbar area of the back. And then we can also see that in most cases, the pelvis is tilting under in an incorrect way because it's tilting under because the lumbar part of the back is flexing too much. So in our old fashion, in our classical horses, most of the time the pelvis had the tendency to do this, but in our modern sport horses, because they are so hypermobile, most of the time they compensate by tilting the pelvis too much under, hyperflexing the lumbar area, hollowing this part of the back, and here we can see what happens here. 
So if we follow the green line, we can see that the transition from the cervical vertebrae to the thoracal vertebrae is, has a very nice angle. But here we can see that the angle is becoming quite sharp. And what that means for the horse, that if we have the vertebrae here, if you have a sharp angle, this will happen in this area. So this part is getting wider and there's a lot of compression here. So here there's a disc in between. But a bigger problem is the joints that are in between every vertebrae. So these are the facet joints. There's not a lot of movement possible. Well, there is actually quite some movement possible, but not if you do this, because if the angle of the vertebrae becomes like this, you can see that the facet joints are also under a lot of pressure. And what do we see now in the past 10, 15 years? A lot of problems in the base of the neck. So a lot of osteoarthritis or synovitis in C6, C7. And then my colleagues tell me that we have a lot of horses that uh, when they were growing up, they fell over. So we have a lot of stupid horses here in the Netherlands because so many horses fall in the pasture and then they get osteoarthritis here. But I don't believe it's true. It's due to incorrect training because it's not only the posture of the horse that is incorrect. Also, there's a lot of pressure because here we've done some measurements. Well, I didn't do it, but researchers did some uh, measurements on how much pressure is used on the mouth of the horse. And that can be up to 20 kilogram. Well, a horse, if, you, if his head is like this and you start to pull, the horse cannot protect his uh, neck against that force. A horse has uh, quite a heavy head and he is grazing normally. And all the structures in his neck are there to protect the horse from the weight from the head. So the horse can really uh, keep his head stable when it lowers and when it lengthens. But there are no structures that can protect when we are compressing the neck and when we are shorting it. So what is the length of the neck? The length of the neck is not about this because actually when you ride a horse low, deep and round, you get this. So the top line is longer, but it is the distance between the, uh, the chest and the chin. So you can see that here, the distance is short. So if we shorten the neck, we lower the first part of the back and we flex the lumbar area. And that means that we can have all kinds of problems. So I just say them uh, shortly because I want to talk uh, about the correlation between tendon injuries and um, uh, the incorrect posture. So um, here, but if there's a lot of pressure, we can see problems here in the mouth, um, in the medibula. Uh, we can see problems here because there's a lot of tension on the nubal ligaments. So the attachment here starts to be irritated and we can see a new bone formation. And that can be quite painful. Uh, we can see that there is too much pressure on C2, C3, and there's a bursa over here. So that means that the horse can develop bursitis. The most common problem that we see is the osteoarthritis in this area, but also if the horse has a straight back, the spinous processes are nicely away from each other. But if the horse makes, is that visible? No, not really good visible. So if the horse makes a shape like this, the spinous processes come together in the area just behind the withers, but also here in the lumbar area. So in most cases of kissing spines, it is because of incorrect posture. And you can also see that the, because of the hyperflexion here in the lumbar area, there is a lot of tension on the sacrum and the SI joints. And so what we also see is if we can diagnose a horse with kissing spines, because kissing spines was actually one of the first diagnoses we could really do in a horse because we didn't have ultrasound at that time. 
at least not for diagnosing SI joints. Um, first, we thought that kissing spines was just one problem, but now we know if there's a horse with kissing spines, most of the time we also find osteoarthritis here and here. But now let's go to a really interesting part. How are tendon injuries correlated with an incorrect posture? If the horse is shortened in the neck, that means that he will put his weight on his forehand. We can see that the withers are lowering, and that also means that the sternum is going down. And when the sternum is going down, it means that the horse will fall over, has too much weight on his forehand, and the legs will go into that direction, the front legs. And then you can see that the time that the front legs are on the ground is longer and the uh, position of the joints is incorrect. And that means that there is a lot of tension on those uh, structures here, so on the tendons, especially the suspensory ligaments. And I will show you some pictures later because then we can look what happens in the hind legs. Uh, it didn't fit on my uh, whiteboard, but there is overextension in the stifle, the hock, and um, there is a lot of traction on the suspensory ligament as well. So that is one of the reasons, incorrect load of the legs because of incorrect posture. But if a horse is in incorrect posture, it needs to protect itself. And like I said, there are no structures that can protect the horse uh, if there's a rider pulling on his mouth because it's a force in that direction. And that means that the fascia and that's connective tissue, and I will show you some pictures later, that connective tissue is going to restrict to protect the, these areas of the horse. So most of the time I see restrictions in the core of the horse, but those restrictions will get worse and worse because those fascia are in lines and we know at least 11 lines and they are all connected with each other. So that means that there is a line here in the front leg of the horse and one going in that direction. So if there is a problem here and the horse is restricting his fascia here, it will spread into these directions. And if it spreads, it means that the fascia will become tight here in the leg and the fascia are directly connected with the tendons. And that means that there is too much strain on the tendons. And that means that a chronic overload will cause tendon injuries, but it can seem acute as well because there's too much strain on this tendon already. So if the horse is making just a small misstep, that can be just uh, too much, although it's a little misstep and there will be an acute injury, at least. It seems as if it is an acute injury because probably this has been going on for months or even years. So I'd like to show you some pictures because that will make it more um, lively. So here we can see a horse in a correct forward, downward, outward posture. We can see the nose in front of the vertical. We can see the nice arch in the neck. And with the green arrow, you can see that um, the length of the neck is um, defined by the uh, distance from the chest to the chin. The back of the horse is up. So even under the saddle, the back of the horse is upwards. And we can see that the front legs of the horse are nicely going forward. And interestingly enough, you can also see that the shoulder blade of the horse is loose, so it's uh, relaxed. And we can see a difference in the hind leg and the front leg, because some people believe that this is horse is standing on one front foot, but that's not true. This is a relaxed shoulder and the movement of the front leg is different from the movement of the hind leg. And that has to do with the, the form of the shape of the joints, but that's a different story. So keep this picture in mind. And then we will have a look at this picture. And this is the same horse. And this horse was in rehabilitation. Um, and the rider, she wanted the best for her horse, but she didn't know that this posture was not correct. 
So Jochen has been talking about facial expression. Look at the facial expression of his this horse. This is a very nice, very uh, willing horse. But still, you can see, so this horse is actually really suffering in silence because he does whatever the rider wants him to do. But if you look at his eyes, they are open and they are not soft like the eyes of this horse. Well, it's the same horse, of course. Um, but here, his eye is very soft and there are no wrinkles in his face and his lips are very soft. And when we look at this picture, we can see that his mouth is open and there's a lot of tension in his lips. Um, what we can see as well is that the horse is lowering in the thoracal part of the back and that we see a lot of tension here in the muscles of the neck. And the distance from the chin to the chest is very short and that means that the stride is becoming short. And what we can also see is that this horse is landing very incorrectly. That is because of this posture and the horse is landing here on the heel because he is not um, really uh, making a correct stride because the stride is restricted forward. And that means that if the horse is landing like this, this he is overloading his tendons over and over again. And another interesting fact is the here we can actually really see that the horse is standing on one front leg. So in this case, the weight of the horse has shifted forward. And one other important thing is that the position of the leg is far underneath the body and it should be more forward. So this leg is carrying a lot of weight. Just to compare a few pictures, I placed them next to each other so you can really see the difference. And you can see the difference in the facial expression in the top line. So the top line of the right horse is hollow and the left horse is um, bended, so in flexion. Uh, and you can see the difference in the strides. Here I have another example of a horse. This is not a forward, downward, outward posture, but this is what I see many times when people decide it's time to collect, even if they started with the correct forward, downward, outward posture. So here they also shortened the neck. We can see the hollow back and we can see that the sternum is sinking downwards. We can see an incorrect angle in the front leg and we can see the overextension here in the, in the hook and in the stifle. So this posture in the horse will cause a lot of problems. Here, you can see my own horse and Jochen asked me, do you have time to ride your own horse? And I said, yes, occasionally. So this is the proof. Um, you can see that this horse, it's a young horse. And what I call a young horse is a six year old horse and he can do a walk, trot and canter on both reins in balance on his own feet. And I just start to collect him a little bit. But you can see that I keep the length in the neck because the distance from the chin to the chest is a lot longer than in the other pictures. So here you can see my young horse and you can see how he already developed his back. So if you look at the top line, you can see that his back is up. And we have a, a very light S-carve, but that's just the spinal processes, because if we were uh, able to look at the spine, we could see that his back was completely straight. And this is what happens when we train a horse in an incorrect posture. And of course, there are other factors involved, like a saddle. Um, but here we can see that the horse has a hollow back. We can see that there is a dip in front of the withers. The top line in the neck didn't develop and also in the back it didn't develop. And we can see a lot of musculature in the underline of the neck. And we can see a lot of tension because we can see a lot of lines in the muscles of the shoulder and the triceps. And of course, when we look at the pelvis, we can also see that it is tilted under. We can see that flexion in the back that I was talking about. So. If you see this picture in a horse, you know that there have been troubles for a long time. And this horse um, was trained low, deep and round with the chin to the neck, not even to the chest for three years. And this was the result. Now I have another example. This is even a worse case. 
you can really recognize now that there is a dip in front of the withers, that the back is really hollow, the pelvis is tilted under. We can see a short uh, top line of the back and a long uh, underline of the back. And this is not confirmation. So when I started as a veterinarian, I didn't recognize these horses because you see so many of them that you start to believe that this is a normal back. So please keep this picture in your brain so you can start to recognize the problems in your own horse and also in uh, other horses so you can help them out because most of these problems are overlooked or people think it is due to confirmation. So the last picture I have for you is also a rehabilitation horse. On the left uh, picture, we see it and we see the same characteristic, characteristics. So it's always the same picture that you see, but sometimes a little bit more or less in the pelvis or a little bit more in the back that just depends on how the horse compensated. But in the left picture, we can see that the top line didn't develop from the neck and the back, hollow back again, dip in front of the withers, the sternum is going downwards, but you can also see that this horse is in a bad con uh, general condition. Three months later, we can see the same horse. And of course, there's also a difference between winter and spring. But uh, we can also see that the horse completely changed. Um, he has a now very nicely developed neck. The back came up. The angle of the pelvis is not that tilted under anymore. Uh, we can see a different expression on his face and the neck lengthened. And what we did with this horse was a lot of body work to get all the restrictions of the fascia out. We changed the saddle. We changed the way of training. We corrected the balance of his feet and we changed his nutrition. So I was always taught if you want to scientifically prove that something works or if you want to work in an evidence-based way, you can only change one thing because otherwise you cannot prove that one thing works. But I learned in, when I was really rehabilitating horses myself that I have to combine things because if I don't combine things, it is not going to work. So I hope that it is uh, clear um, what I mean about the top line and the top line syndrome. And here I have some pictures for you. Um, I want to say a few words about the fascia system because on the left picture, we can see the musculature of the neck and all that white stuff is fascia and fascia is connective tissue. And that connective tissue is uh, surrounding every fiber of the muscle, every um, part of the musculature and it's surrounding at the, the, the entire muscle. It's separating muscles, but it's also connecting musculature. So if we look at this, uh, we can see that um, most of the time uh, the muscle continues in a tendon. And here on the right picture, I have some tendons for you. And if we look at the model of the horse a little bit differently, so here, um, these are the extend, uh, extender tendons. Um, they are connected with a muscle head. And that muscle head is a sort of web with connective tissue with muscle cells in it. And that contact, connective tissue con, uh, continues in those tendons. And that means that we have to look at a completely different way, not a horse that's built out of bone, um, connective tissue, tendons and uh, musculature, but it's all one system. It's all a web of connective tissue with muscle cells in it or even organ cells in it. So I hope that I gave you some idea about um, the correlation between uh, problems in the top line, problems in the uh, posture of the horse and the problems you can have with tendon injuries. That was fascinating. It was really, really good. I'm just trying to uh, see if my camera works. Here we go. Um, maybe Sonia can um, help me out here. He's always in the background to help us. And you uh, mentioned so many things, which I think um, can be sometimes overwhelming for people who are not into this as deep as you and I are. 
you know, you, you understand anatomy, physiology, but you, you explained it so nice and that people can really follow that. And the underlying issue is the, the sensitivity of the front legs. And I like to, um, uh, let me see if I can put this here quick together, um, continue what you were saying with, with you, you mentioned um, science and you mentioned um, um, evidence-based and that's the whole model of saddle fit for life. You know, we follow facts and science and when it comes to saddle fitting and when I listen to what you say, it, it kind of always remind me what my dad told us, you know, people who know the how will always follow the people who know the why. You explained beautiful why we see so much tendon injury and what will happen to the horse when you ride him in that uh, extremely uh, low neck. And I think we also need to understand why we have so many differences. You know, I, I love, Karen, I love the title of your book. And uh, it says, correct me if I'm misquoting, is it compassionate training for today's sport horse? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and how did you come up with that title? Well, that was because I wanted to place the horse first. So compassionate is about um, training a horse for the well-being of the horse. Uh, you want to have a healthy horse in a mental and a physical way. So when I started to learn about training, I wanted to know what is good for the horse, what works for the horse. And I let the horses teach me. Like you say, it's so important that you can read the horse, that you can see his facial expression, because many horses just do whatever you want to do, even if it hurts their bodies. Um, so you have to look for very subtle signs. And of course, I had teachers who would buck me off if I made one mistake, and they were also very, <laughs> very good teachers for me. Um, so I... I, of course, I had teachers and I had masters, but the biggest teachers were the horses. Yes, and um, I um, talk sometimes about when in my profession, when we talk about pressure, I mean, there are so many devices where we can use today to identify pressure with computerized saddle pad. And there are so many comments about dry spots. And if you look at the cross section and the muscular tissue here at the withers, that's where the saddle, most of the saddle companies have a metal plate that's called a gullet plate. There's metal in the horse's mouth. There's metal on the horse's feet. So while the saddle has stuffing and padding, that metal part sits over that area, which could cause quite a bit of force. And when we go back to uh, the papers, what was published 2014 at the University of Scotland, it is interesting to see that um, what the expert, like your professional veterinarian say, and, I, and that's why I loved your presentation. You know, you're a passionate rider, but you can back it up with everything you learned, how the connective tissue, the muscle, the fascia, the tendon, how all that works and how that affects if you train incorrectly. So when we talk about pressure and we talk about saddle fit and we talk about atrophy and, 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 and horrible uh, training ways or uh, horrible saddle fitting. I mean, this is what I dedicate my life, you know, so I don't want anybody to, to, to lose their best friend and going the wrong path because somebody doesn't have maybe quite the why behind, maybe a good comparison. Karin, you told me that um, Sometimes that was a little hard because you really stand up for the horse and you're not really liked from your own professionals. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, um, at a certain moment, I started to realize that if you inject joints, uh, it's a quick fix and it has only a temporary result. Um, so if I start to advise people not to inject joints, and occasionally I do, there are some when I have an older horse and there is a, 
a problem with one of the with this, um, the fetlock tunnel syndrome, for example. And when you have a young horse, you can perform surgery. But with a horse from 24, 25 years old, I say, OK, let's give it a try. Let's use some corticosteroids in um, in that area. But that's only occasionally, maybe once every two years. I think that this is the best solution. So at the moment, you start to advise different things that are generally accepted. Um, well, people don't really like you anymore. And of course, um, I started to do some work with thermography. And then uh, veterinary colleagues said, well, that's not evidence-based. And that it's uh, of no use because there are circumstances like the rain, the cold, the wind. And if you put a rock on your horse. And then I say, yeah, but if you put a horse in a stable and you don't put any rock on it and there's no wind and no rain in the stable, you can do uh, thermography. But they never wanted to really look into it. So um, I guess I've been just trying different things that were not really accepted. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Why don't they want to? I mean, if, if every veterinarian goes into vet school with helping animals, why why you see so many in your profession going the wrong way? Your... Yeah, well, I think that there, of course, uh, many things are very important uh, about the work of veterinarians. Um, actually, if my horse has a colleague, I have to call one of my uh, colleagues because I don't have the equipment anymore in my car to treat my own horse. So. There are many, many good things that veterinarians do, but especially with chronic problems, chronic lameness, chronic back pain, um, they didn't really look further than they were taught. And um, when I was in veterinary school, I sort of was brainwashed that everything needed to be evidence-based, but they forget that experimenting, so empirical research is also research. So it doesn't always have to be, um, if, um, there doesn't have to be research done as an external research. You can also try something, do it with many horses. And if you get the same outcome, it's also very useful. Yes, yes. And, you know, and that's what we have measured over 150 horses. And I remember when I met one veterinarian, exactly the same what you were just saying, you know, it, the conditions are correctly and you've been schooled how to use the thermography correctly. You can actually use it a lot for diagnosis. It's just a tool like anything else. And um, same in our industry, Karin, as a saddle maker or saddle fitter or salesperson, you get brainwashed to sell a product that has the highest profit. You know, there is tools would come from France you know, it, it's just another tool like the thermography here. Uh, this is uh, what measures the heart rates, the cadence. I mean, very simple ways of how we can say, well, that type of fitting doesn't work. And then there are some saddle fitters who say, I don't need to measure in front of the shoulder because it doesn't, the saddle shouldn't sit on the shoulder, right? Why would I measure the shoulder? Because horses, shoulders, like you demonstrated, you know, they move. You want to lift up the sternum the leg extent, the scapula goes back. And these are the pictures I got from one of your colleagues. Um, I mentioned earlier from uh, South Africa who worked in England and she explained us the deformity and the changes in the bones, as well as what you explained, kissing spine, but also the problem what we see where the spinal nerves comes out, that whole decreases as well. So compression, and arthritis and we see all these issues. So as a saddle maker, you know, when, when I hear in the way you explain to so now it's long and low, we want the shoulder to be free. And there is so much information out there and it's hard for the people to say, which way do I go? So over the last 42 years, when you measure 150 horses, and now you have this equipment, for what we have today, and you learn from the masters, from the horse, and you can see what they do, and you listen to other masters, and they say, if you don't fit the rider first, the horse will suffer pain. I mean, you just have to look at rodeo riders or bullfighters. They sit at the base of the withers for a reason, because there's the least amount of movement and if we should 
be soft as a writer, like the teacher in the Spanish writing school for 400 years, you got to have that natural shoulder, hips and heels to have a pliable seat. If you do sit in a saddle, Karin, you know what I was told the first when I made a saddle in a company that's over 150 years old, they taught me, let me find a tree. I want to show you this. You see Actually, this? I was hoping we could jump right into uh, the Q&A quickly. Yes. Because we only have really 10 good, minutes, right? Yeah, I had a really good question from one of our other channels in regard. Okay, let me just finish quick this point. Yeah, here. go ahead. Do you see this tree here? You see yes, this? I see it, yeah. Okay, so the first thing I was taught from a company that's over 150 years old, they say, make the saddle nice and pointy in the crotch. And I say, why? Because that's how my father taught us, figure out why. And he said, so that the rider doesn't hurt his parts, but there's <laughs> no woman who wants to sit on the rooftop. And that's just one out of nine different pieces what are so complete different from a male to a female saddle. Tailbone, hip angle, pelvis axis, and so on and so forth. So as uh, Sonia said, we want to go to um, uh, the questions right away. So I will not do uh, my presentation, just end it up with, if we want to train the horse correctly, the way you just demonstrated, and if we want to have a pliable seat, that's a must, then we can ignore what nature and science taught us. There's a complete different pelvis in a female saddle. And as a manufacturer myself who builds saddles, I can then say to, to veterinarians or doctors, you're not a saddler, I know what to do because I was taught. Maybe I want to listen to the doctors and the veterinarian and say, maybe, maybe I do want to make a gender appropriate saddles because that is what the majority of the riders are riding now, are women, you know, and, and many people don't know how the bone structure is of the horse. You know, so they, they compare themselves to the horse, but that's not how we want to ride. We want to ride soft, gentle, and give the horse every ability with the proper training and riding, like you said, to do it. So for me, it is absolutely crucial that I find people such as yourself that I find, I call them the lone soldiers because you need to be brave to stand against your profession, like you just said, and you need to speak for the horse. And sometimes the sugar coating is not what everybody wants to hear. And that's why we, we build Saddle Fit for Life. And that's why we have people such as yourself on board. So thanks again to part of it. And let's go right to the question. Okay, so the first question I have from another channel is in regards to, and this goes back to the presentation via Karen, who talks about the posture of the horse is people who take the course and become either a CEE or CSE. We always focus on the dynamic and I want you to sort of emphasize the importance of whatever saddle fitter the client has out to look at the horse, not just statically, but in movement as well, to, to um, identify some of the movement patterns that maybe is from poor riding, but could also be from bad saddle fit that uh, are key elements for people to identify issues. So when you go out and you see a horse and you're doing an assessment, what are some of the movement patterns that you see or posture issues that you see in horses with a bad saddle that you can relay that information to the owner? I'm gonna quote first a veterinarian by the name Dr. Tracy Turner. He said to me, pay attention for the first eight circles. Don't wait until the professional or somebody says, I need to warm him up. Don't wait until the back is numb. You want to watch how do they ride the horse? Do they understand the principle of the training and riding and how do they come into the saddle and how does the horse move without big interference? Here is a video um, we set a little bit further back of the withers and we can see how much difference the muscular and the shoulder moves upwards, backwards, 
how much motion there is. And that's when you measure a horse in the cross style or in the, in the barn and you get that saddle fitted and you got wonderful measuring devices. The static fit is so irrelevant. The saddle has to fit in motion. So that is just, that is just the front. If we look at that uh, back, what happens in the back, this is a horse in the treadmill. I did this at the University in Cambridge in England. It's in the water right now. And you can see uh, the movement of the back. And obviously it looks completely different. You can see the shoulder movement upwards, backwards, completely different than a horse standing. So ask if you get a saddle fitted, ask them to look at the saddle sitting static and how does the saddle fit in motion? And Hopefully the saddle fitter or equine ergonomist is um, an equine special, or not necessarily special, but a rider. So he can understand what you're saying. Did that answer your question? Yes, that answers it perfectly. And um, that's it for the questions right now. And which is actually a good thing because we are closing off. Um, I first of all wanted to say thank you to Corinne for a wonderful presentation. Um, we got a lot of positive reviews from the viewers. And if you have any sort of closing statements that you want to leave our viewers with, you as well, Joachim, um, now is the time to share it. Okay, Karin. Yes, yeah, so, well, um, <laughs> I'd like to say that um, it's so important to share the knowledge. So. Um, even if you are an owner and you're not a professional, um, of course, you cannot ask people to believe what you are saying or demand it. Um, and the best thing to do is to wait for people to ask for your advice, because if you give your advice without them asking, um, nine out of 10 times, they don't want it. Uh, but you as an owner are also very important. So you can give a good example. This is what happened with many of the horses that I rehabbed, that the owners really started to give good examples. And then at first people were laughing at them because the way I train horses, it takes more time. You are working for two years with your horse before you have your basic balance and then you can continue. Um, but then the horses start to do really, really very well. And then people start to ask questions. So please share your knowledge with everybody and you can help changing the life of horses. Yes, so well said. And for me, spotting, if you are into Western or into dressage or jumper, and yes, people used to ride without saddles and Saddles are built for different breed, different sports. Uh, horses move differently in jumping versus dressage. The same thing with uh, gated horses. In the end of the day, you know, look at the horse. You know, when, when your friend saddle you borrowed because your saddle is in for repair and your horse is acting out like this, what he has never done, only what changed is the equipment, the saddle, okay? Or let's say the other way. With your saddle, the horse is acting like this and your friend gives you the saddle and all of a sudden the horse is happy. There is very few little tips I can give you quick. They're called that in the old army time, Paul Stecken, he died recently. He told me they called this the dark zone here, the back area, the lumber. Many, many, many saddles sit way too long. Here you see the lumbers versus processes. And with today's shorter back horses we have, it is a given, you know, this was the, from the breeder. We have horses in the old days was a rectangle. Now the rectangle is upwards, it's, it's upright. Chest is much narrow. We got super long necks. And that's why I like the book from Karin so much because we need to understand how do we ride these modern sport horses. So my part, my passing or my parting words is there is a lot of information. That's why we give this lots of courses on this. It's um, uh, videos are free. Lots of courses cost a little money, but if you really want to help your horse, I always encourage people um, just like Karin said, try it. I wanted to share this very quick video. Um, let me see if it's plays. It's a very, um, Nope, I won't play, so that means I'm not supposed to show it. That's fine. 
<laughs> a minute, because it's really beautiful to see how the horse can move, but it's okay. It's not meant to be. Maybe next time, leaves you suspended. But um, like you said, um, Sonia, we need to sign off. The hour went by and um, I love to uh, repeat this more. I know, Karen, you have so much to give. And when I Googled and researched you and you do the whole horse approach, I love it that you look at everything and not just the training. And that is what everybody should do. And we, we welcome everybody to also look at the saddles. It doesn't need to be a mystery. It doesn't need to be uh, a unit what costs a lot. It's just that you understand what happens statically in motion under the saddle and on top of the saddle. Sonia, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us. And as always, this will be available for viewing uh, later on if you did join a little bit later. Um, and be, be sure to join us next week when we have yet another presentation. So take care everyone and we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karin. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.